Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir, we can see, the, see your screen. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let us start. Okay, any, any questions from last time? So last time we stopped at this uh, colony. Uh, some languages. Are not. That's a nice thing. Any question related to this query, uh, this gallery, or any other thing that we did last time before we move on? So let's try to understand what does it mean by saying that some languages are not being recognized. I'm so, sorry. yes. Sir, from the last class, um, we came up with this result after seeing that there are. Um, the set of all languages is uncountable, right? Yeah. And so uh, there are some languages for which we do not have. Any and, yeah, for, uh, yeah, exactly. So that was the reason why some languages are not doing recognizable. Exactly. Am I correct? Okay, thank you. So we will go through that result one more time uh, quickly. So let's try to understand what does uh, what does this statement say. This statement says that there are some languages which are not Turing recognizable. So when we say that something is not Turing recognizable, it means that it is by default also not Turing recognizable. So so remember we had uh, regular languages at the heart, and then we had uh, context free languages, uh, and then we had um, Turing. Uh, decidable languages, and then we have Turing um, recognizable, right? So we have regular languages, then we have context free languages, then we have Turing decidable languages, and we have uh, Turing recognizable languages. And then I said that there are some languages which are outside the Turing recognized language, right? So, so for these, so, so if, if, if we go uh, from this direction onwards, we know that um, this regular language is the most primitive kind of language. Right? So uh, these languages can be recognized or accepted by a very simple primitive uh, computation model, which is the FA or NFA. But as you move along uh, toward the outside, uh, you need more and more, uh, I mean, sophisticated machinery to accept. Right? For example, we need push automata, then we need Turing machines, and then we need uh, even more powerful things. So as we go outside, toward the outside of these circles, we need more and more sophisticated and powerful machines. Uh, but when we go inside, we need a very perfect machine. So it means that uh, during the recognizable languages are those languages which are, which could be considered as one of the, which can be considered the languages for which we need the most sophisticated machine, right? And even then we are not able to answer all the queries on the membership queries. For example, if I say that a language M is a Turing recognizable language, it means that no matter what uh, Turing machine I can come up with, uh, if it is non-deterministic or deterministic or it has multiple tapes, any tape regardless, uh, there would be some uh, things from, from the, over the sigma star for which it would be impossible to answer if X belongs to the language or x does not belong right so it will be hard to answer these questions. these questions are 
basically the membership queries. And we have already seen that membership queries are very important to um, any computational problem and they can be used in machine learning. <clears throat> so for every uh, language that is a Turing recognizable language, there exists some strings for which it is impossible to verify the membership anyway, right? No matter how complicated or sophisticated our Turing machine is. But then uh, from this picture above, it seems that there are languages which are outside the same circle, which we call Turing recognizable languages, for which, for which it is impossible even to know that a string may or may not uh, belong to the language at all, right? So we cannot even recognize. So, so decide, deciding is, is, is a bigger thing, but over here, we're not even talking about deciding. We are saying that it is even impossible to think about a Turing machine, which can even accept some of those strings or, or it can tell us anything about the languages. So these are the strings, these are the languages, sorry. Uh, these are the languages which are outside uh, this big circle and there are many such right and in fact uh, we can show that the number of languages which are outside this big circle is are more than the number of languages that we have inside this all of these languages combined uh, makes a set which is smaller than the set of languages which is outside okay and the reason is this problem that some languages are not during practice the reason is very simple. For example, if you try to prove it, uh, the proof is very simple. Uh, we know that imagine there is some alphabet over which we are talking about strings. And we can make our life easy and we can say that without loss of generality, imagine that sigma is just zero one. It doesn't matter if the sigma is just two characters or three or five, uh, it will still work. So if sigma just contains two characters, zero and one, then we know that sigma star is an infinite. Okay. Uh, but sigma star is not just infinite, it is countably infinite. Why this countably infinite, infinite set? Because we can create an enumeration, we can create a counting mechanism, we can, we can give a sequencing, we can see the sequencing of all the strings which are in this sigma star. Since our sigma contains just zero and one, we know that our sigma star must contain strings like the empty string zero, one, then zero, zero, and then zero, one, and one, zero, one, one, and zero, 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 and zero, zero, one, and so on, right? So these are, this is the string with, with length zero. These are the two strings with length one. Uh, these are four strings with length two. Then there would be eight strings with length three, and so on and so forth. So we can, create a sequence of these, right? So you can create a simple algorithm uh, which will generate all these, uh, which will generate all these strings forever, right? It will never stop, it will keep generating these. And we know that if we can generate, it's, it's like an enumerator. An enumerator means that it is, it is possible to count. So enumeration means that we are counting. So sigma star is count. So we can actually count in how many strings are. Even though there are infinitely many, but we can create a bijection from uh, a bijection from the set of natural numbers to sigma star. So we can create such a function f, which is a bijection um, from the set of natural numbers from sigma star. And if it is a bijection, then we know that the size of natural numbers is the same as the size of the sigma star. And if n is countable, then sigma star is also countable. So it means that sigma star is count. Now we turn our attention to a uh, set of all languages. Okay. Suppose this L, this calligraphic L is the set of all languages. Okay. Then we need to understand what is meant by a language. A language is a set of strings, right? Now imagine the sigma star. The sigma star contains empty and zero, one and zero, zero and zero, one and so on. So what we can do, we can take some of these strings. Remember, there are infinitely many strings. 
So we can take some of these strings and create a subset. And that subset will be called a language. And that subset could be a finite set or it could be an infinite set. But the number of elements in that would be countable in any case, right? Because a subset of a countable set is is countable. So it means that we can create a language from this set and that language will still be countable because then we will be able to um, enumerate or, or count. Right? But the problem is there are there are many more languages then there could be Turing machines. Why? Because remember Turing machine, if I have a Turing machine M, then I can convert this Turing machine into its encoding, right? And we can always convert an encoding into just a sequence of zeros and ones. So it means that whatever encoding we would have, it would be a long sequence of zeros and ones. And that encoding will exist somewhere in this set because this set contains all possible binary stuff, all possible strings of zeros and ones. And since encoding of a Turing machine is also a string of zeros and one, it could be very large, doesn't matter, but that must exist somewhere here, right? Not all strings that exist here correspond to some um, Turing machine, but all Turing machine must have some corresponding string over here, right? Now, all realizable, all legitimate Turing machine encodings which exist here will definitely be smaller set than the set sigma star. Even though, I mean, in smaller in a sense that uh, not every string is over there, some strings will not be there, of course, not all. Uh, for example, this does not make any sense for a Turing machine. This does not make any sense as encoding of a Turing machine and so on and so forth. So it means that all legitimate encodings of Turing machines will be there and plus many other encodings would be there which do not uh, correspond to any legitimate or legal Turing machine, right? So it means that this, this set of all encodings of all possible Turing machine is a subset of this set. And subset of any countable set is countable. We have already seen it, right? So it means that set of all possible Turing machines is also countable. But the set of all possible languages is uncountable. Therefore, there will still be some languages which cannot be recognized by Turing machines. So this is what exactly this corollary talked about. I hope this is clear. Is this thing clear to all? Yes, sir. So, is there any, any question? So, let us try to understand how to prove this theorem. It says ATM is undecided. Okay. And how do we define ATM? We define ATM as it is the set, it is the language which consists of M and W such that M is a Turing machine. Okay. And M sets. Okay, so this is our definition of A. So far, so good. Any questions? So we need to prove. Need to show prove that ATM is undecidable. This is to prove. So let's prove it. Step number one assume ATM is decided. 
So this means it is approved by Congress. Is this in clear? Imagine, assume that ATM is this. If it means that it's a proof by contradiction, we will try to create a machine which will decide this type with this, which will decide this language ATM. And then we will say that, then we will show that if such a machine exists, then it will lead to contradictions. So the first step, assume that ATM is decided. Okay. Now, if it is decidable, it means that there must exist a machine which will decide it. So we say that suppose H is the machine, okay? H is the machine or H is the decider, okay, for ATM. So since we assume that ATM is decidable, so we say that, okay, imagine that H is said that machine uh, which decides ATM, okay? And H decides ATM, on the input, what is the input to the set? Input to this steering machine, encoding M W. Okay, so how, how do we define H? We say this H, which takes this input M and W. So this is our input to the function or to the steering machine. H. It accepts. If M accepts W and rejects if M does not. Okay, simple, clear. So this H is a machine which takes the input MW, which is exactly the input that is given to our ATM. So we say that inside this H, what we would do, this machine H will create a machine M and pass this W to this machine M and see it, wait and see that if, M, if, if the machine M accepts, if it does, then it will also accept. Okay. So there is a problem, it should not be accept. If M accepts, then machine H also accepted. If M does not accept, then machine M does reject. Clear? Any questions so far? Sir? Yes. So you said that if uh, it re uh, if M does not accept W, it rejects, but M can go into, an, uh, into an, uh, a loop. So yes. wouldn't it be better to say if M rejects, then you reject? Uh, yes, you are right in a sense, but but the thing is that we do not know whether uh, such a machine H exists, right? So we are saying that uh, we would be able to figure it out that if, if uh, M does not exist. So we are not depending on that whether M accepts or M rejects, rather than we say that the machine H is capable of figuring it out that if M will accept, um, if M will accept these things up. And if it can figure it out that M will accept W, then it will also figure it out that it M will not accept. So what happens internally, M is, is, is not an issue here. Right? So since we are hypothetically creating a machine head, we know we would later show that it is impossible to create such a machine because of some contradiction that we will face. So, so we imagine that this machine exists. Okay? So this machine would be able to give us an answer as it can. Okay. 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 So you may imagine that this does not accept may translate. Fails itself. Okay. And this machine H is powerful enough to figure it out. Okay, how does it figure it out? We are not concerned right now, but we imagine that the machine exists and it doesn't. Clear? Okay. Uh, based on this machine uh, H, we will create a new machine. And we would call that machine V. Okay, 
So we would create a Turing machine D, and we would say that this machine D is a new machine. Okay, and D works on uh, as follows. So D will have so D will have H as the stability. Okay. So what what does this D do? So D is a machine. D is a machine which requires just one thing. That requires the encoding of some machine. Okay, it requires encoding of some machine and it gives us two answers, either accept or it rejects. So it, it will give us an answer accept or it When does it accept? It accepts if M does not accept M. Okay. If M accepts. Okay. So before I define or explain it more, so let me uh, give you more details about how this D works. So what happens is, <clears throat> So we already know that how this machine H looks. So based on this machine H, we will create a new machine D. And on this new machine D, uh, so suppose this is our machine D. Okay, this is our machine D. Inside this machine D, we have machine H. Okay, and machine H requires two things, right? It requires M and W. And then it, accept and it rejects, right? So what you would do, we would connect this accept to reject. And we will connect this accept to, to connect this reject to. Accept. So this is what we did. We just flip the outputs of this pitch. Not only that, what we do, we take a machine's encoding, some machine's encoding, okay? And pass that machine as this machine, as well as the input. So the input this H receives is machine M as well as the encoding. Okay. Does it make sense? Sir, are you saying that instead of W, H receives the encoding of M? Yes. So let me let me briefly describe what is this machine H. H takes two inputs, M and W. Right? Right or wrong? Yes, sir. Okay. So if I if I create this machine H as a block diagram, so if I say this is H, uh, then it receives M, it receives W. Or if I want, I can show both these inputs together and I say that it receives M and W, right? And it does something in it and it says accept the input or reject the input, right? When it says accept, it means that this machine M, the, so, so, the, so the encoding of the machine M, so if I, was able to construct the machine from the encoding of M, and I pass W to that machine, it will accept, right? And reject means that H was able to figure it out that M will not accept or M will fail to accept W, so it rejects, right? This is the working of H. Now I'm saying that take this machine H and put it inside another machine D. Okay? So let's call this machine D, it's a bigger machine because it incorporates H in it. Okay, so we have the machine H over here. Okay, and this is the machine D. What we do? So we do first thing that whenever the machine H accepts, so this is the accept. So 
for accept, I would just say plus. And for reject, I would say minus. Whenever it accepts, just connect it to, to the reject of the, just flip it. Okay, so we just flip the output of H as the output of D. So if the machine H says accept, then the machine D will say reject. And the machine H will say reject, machine D will say accept. That's it. So we just flip it. But you remember what was the input to H? Input to H is encoding of, of a machine and some string. So rather than sending M and W, what do we send? We send, we send M together with its own encoder. And this is exactly what we receive as M which is the input to them, okay? So don't get confused. Uh, this is a very, uh, I mean, common thing that we all do in our programming life, for example. Um, so I, I've given this example before as well. So for example, you write a program, let's say test.cpp, okay? And then pass this program to C++. On this GCC, it will create let's say test.exe. Our test.exe is an executable file written in C++. So the program was written in C++, which is sent to uh, the C++ compiler, let's say GCC, and there was no, there were no errors in in the program, and it compiled successfully, and then it created test.exe, and that test.exe was what, whatever that you were trying to do with with your program, and it and there are no errors. For example, imagine. Now consider another program, and I call this program, imagine that the whole C++ compiler, GCC, is written in one file, or I can combine all the file in one file. Now this GCC compiler is capable enough to compile it, and it will give you GCC.exe. Remember this GCC compiler itself is GCC. Exe. So you can actually give the code that generates the compiler to itself and it will generate another copy of the compiler, right? You can even modify the code and write another compiler, right? So you can use C++ compiler to write a compiler for Python. You can use a Python compiler to write a compiler for C++ or for any other language. And not only that, you can use the compiler to, to compile or to create a compiler of the same language. So you can create a C++ compiler from a C++ compiler, right? From a C++ compiler and so on and so forth, right? So all the C++ compiler that you, um, that you use, they have been written in C++. And all those C++ compilers must have been written by C++ and so on and so forth. It, um, there's an infinite regress kind of thing, right? So there's definitely some point where they all start, but theoretically speaking, they don't have to, right? So you can create an infinite regress kind of thing, right? So a C++ compiler can give rise to another C++ compiler and so on and so forth. So there is nothing problematic in sending M in encoding of M. So we are sending a machine M its own encoding. So M is the machine and M is the encoding, right? So we are asking, we are sending the encoding of the machine M to itself, to this machine H. And what does this H do? It just, H just checks if the machine M will accept the input or not. If it, if it accepts, it will say accept. If it rejects, it will say reject. But whatever is the output of the machine H, we will just flip it in the machine D. So if H accepts the input, then D rejects the input. And if H rejects the input, D accepts the input. Is this in clear? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, what is the reason behind doing this? Uh, the reason behind doing this is to show that it is impossible to come up with a decider. So all this, is used to create a contradiction. 
it will show that it is impossible to create a decider for the game. Sir, I meant uh, why is the machine D rejecting when N accepts its own encoding? Um, this is this is the construction. So we are trying to create. So, so bear with me and it will make sense, start making sense. Okay. Is this thing clear? So let me write uh, the description of D again. So D takes the machine in. So it, there's only one input to D. And what does this D do? Uh, D sends uh, this input M with its own encoding to machine H, right? Uh, so D will accept or reject. When, when it will accept, it will accept if M Reject, not reject. Does not accept the encoding of M. And if M accepts the encoding of M. Right? Now, here, sir, here is, yes. Why would M reject its own encoding? Uh, why would M reject M encoding? Go back to the definition of H. So what was the definition of H? H accepts his input if M accepts W. We do not know what this W is, right? So this W could, so we do not know what is this W, we do not know what is this M. So M could be a program. Uh, let's say M is a, is a description of a GCC compiler and W is a program which sorts, let's say not, not sort. So M is a GCC compiler and W is a C++ program which adds two numbers, right? So this machine will accept, but this W could be the code that generates the compiler itself. Right? So this is exactly what we say. Whether this machine will accept the input. So we do not know what is this M. We do not know what is this W. So we do not know what will be the output of it. Okay? So it may accept, it may reject. We do not. Okay? So this is, this is how D is defined. Okay? Now, we would create a very interesting thing over here. So we would say that this is the input, right? So D has some input. And based on the input, it has either, it, it will either accept or it will reject, okay? With the condition that we have uh, just stipulated. Now, what happens when we pass the encoding of D itself to the machine D? So I would just replace this M with D and see what, what kind of uh, things happen. We have either accept or reject. If D does not accept D, if D accepts D. Okay. So it means that whenever D has to accept, it will reject. And whenever D has to reject, it will accept. But this is a contradiction. It's a paradox. It is impossible. Because what we are saying that we are saying that the machine D accepts when the machine D rejects. The machine D rejects when the machine D accepts. So it's, it's a contradiction. So what does, what does machine D do? We do not know, right? So it's a contradiction, it's a paradox. So it's clearly a contradiction. And, and this contradiction was possible because we assume that machine D and machines H, machines D and machines H exist, right? If neither of these two machines exist, then we know that it is impossible to arrive at this contradiction, which, which proves the point that, which proves the point that it is impossible to create either the machine D or machine H, which implies ATM 
is undecided. Okay. Now the behavior of all these machines is is extremely um, predictable. So for example, it receives. Uh, MW, okay, and so M receives HW. We say that D receives uh, M, and then D receives its own description, its own encoding. So we say that H accepts MW exactly when M. We know that D rejects M exactly when M accepts M. And we know that D rejects its own encoding exactly when D accepts. This is the point. This is the contradiction, and therefore, this contradiction tells us that it is impossible to create either the machine H or machine D. And machine H was the machine which actually decided. So, if we say that it is impossible to create H, it means that it is impossible to decide. This isn't clear. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, it may be confusing at first, uh, but I would say that please read the proof in detail. And if you don't understand, please let me know. We will go through the proof. Okay. So I think we can stop here for a break, short break. And then we can come back in like 10 minutes. Is that okay? So can you please have it uh, a 15 minute break? Okay, let's, uh, let's come back at 7.45. Okay, sir, thank you. Okay, let's meet again at 7.45, I will. Share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, I believe that you have a lot of questions. So we started with this theorem. Which says ATM is undecided. Okay. And if you remember, I think uh, last week we talked about another important thing which we call halting problem. Do you remember that? Does anyone remember what is halting problem? Anyone? Sir, uh, you said that ATM is also called the halting problem. Yeah. So let let us uh, go through it one more. <clears throat> uh, so what happens is, uh, for example, if you write, um, let's say you write addition program. It's a very simple program. It's, it's written in C++. Uh, let's say it is add.cpp. What does this program do? Uh, it adds two numbers and it outputs the answer. 
Okay. So for example, if you provide five in seven, then so for example, if this is the input, the output would be twelve. Right. So it takes two numbers and adds them and outputs. So this is simple add program written in C++ or you can call it in Python or Java or whatever programming language that you Now, so this add.cpp would be passed to, let's say, GCC to create add.txt, right? <clears throat> now I can ask one question over here. I can ask that, is it possible to create a program which checks if a given input program will ever stop, okay? It's a very simple task. <clears throat> so I say that this is the program H, which we call the halting program, uh, halting program or halting machine. It takes some C++ program, let's say xyz.cpp, okay? And it checks or tells us that yes, it will stop on some input. No, it will not. For example, so instead of X, Y, Z, if I pass add.cpp, it will say, yes, it will stop. Okay, now consider another program which I write, which is something like this. In Python, for example, uh, which says while true, and there's some code here. Okay, we know that this program will never stop. So let's call this program never stop. When I send this program to H, H will say, no, it will not stop because there is an infinite loop. Okay. So this ATM is basically equivalent of saying that such a program H exists, which will be able to determine if a given input program will ever stop or it will continue forever. Okay, so we need to show whether H exists or not, whether it is possible to construct such a program H, which we call halting prob, halting machine or hold, halting pro, pro, program, or it is impossible, simply impossible to create. Okay, and for this, uh, the proof that we just constructed was basically exactly the same thing, where we try to construct a proof, where we try to construct the machine H, and then we showed that it, it is impossible to create. Okay, so let's go through the proof at a higher level, right? So we say that H is a machine. So this is the machine H, which accepts, okay, if input stops. Okay, reject if input is stuck. Okay, so what this H will do, it H will check the H will check the pro program M and pass this input W to the program and see that if M stops on this input or if M does not. So this is the whole thing machine. And the contradiction that we came up with came up with in, in the proof actually shows that it is impossible to create such a machine. Why? So imagine uh, that we create another machine D, okay? This machine D is basically the duplicate machine. Or a photocopying machine. So what happens is that whatever input that you provide to this machine, it creates it sends that input 
to the machine edge as both as the input, as both as the program, uh, which has to be checked and as the, as the input at, to that program. So we have H inside this one. So this M will be copied here and it will be copied here. As well. So it will send M as well as the encoding. Of L. So this is the pro program B. And not only that, it actually flips the output. That's it, it flips the output. And why do we need to flip it? Because we need to construct we need to come up with a contradiction, okay? <clears throat> now, what happens is that instead of giving any, pro, uh, any machine in, give this machine D itself, okay? If you give this machine itself, then D will accept, let me say, D will reject D if, D will reject D if D accepts. Now this is absurd, right? This is impossible to happen, which means it is a contradiction. In our original assumption that such a halting machine exists is impossible. Therefore, ATM, which was actually exactly the decider for uh, with so H, which is the decider uh, for ATM, it is impossible that such H, H exists, and H basically is the halting machine. Right? And that is the end of the book. Is this in clear now? Does it make any sense? Yes, sir. Okay, anyone else? Okay, okay, before, okay, before we move on, move ahead. Uh, so, <clears throat> so you remember the picture that I showed, regular languages, context-free, Turing decidable, and Turing recognizable, and then I said that there are languages which are not even Turing recognizable. Okay. Now we will try to see a language which is not even Turing recognizable. So we will try to come up with a language which is not even doing that. Okay, but before that, we need some definitions. So, so we already know what is Turing decidable. We already know what is Turing recognizable. Okay. Now we come up with another definition, which we call co Turing recognizable. Okay. So, what is the definition? We say that a language L is co Turing recognizable if it is the complement of a Turing recognizable. So this is the definition. So let's try to understand what does this definition say. <clears throat> so for example, uh, I believe that you are all aware of uh, the meaning of complement. Are you all aware of what is what is meant by complement in set theory? Yes. So for example, if I say that I have a universal set U, and that universal set contains, let's say, one, two, three, and let's say 100. Okay, these are 100 elements which are in the universal set. And I say that, that whatever sets that we will talk about 
would be subsets of universal set, right? So imagine that A is a subset of a universal set. And let's say A contains a one, two, three, four, and five, just five lines. Then we can talk about the complement of A, which is sometimes written as a bar on A, or sometimes written as the C on, on this A. So what is the complement of A in this, in this particular example? So A complement would be everything from the universal set, except for one, two, three, four, and five. So it will have six, it will have seven, eight, nine, and all the way till 100, right? So this is how we define the complement. So complement, in order to find a complement of a set, we need to know the universe. Okay. Now, when we are talking about languages, what is the universal set? The universal set is sigma star, right? Sigma star is the, is the universal set. Why? If sigma is your alphabet, all possible strings, whether they belong to the language or they do not belong to the language, are in sigma star. So if sigma is the alphabet, then sigma star is the set of all possible strings over sigma, right? Sigma is the alphabet, then sigma star is the uh, set of all possible strings over sigma. So if I say that L is a language over sigma star, it means it means the strings in L come from where do they come from? Sigma star. That means that L is a subset of sigma star, right? Now, if L is a subset of a sigma star and L is a language, then I can find out L complement. What would be L complement? L complement would be everything that is in sigma star except for what is in L. So this is called the set mic, right? Sometimes it is written as this. Sometimes it is written as the back. Okay. So this means that this is the uh, this is the L complement. So let's try. Let's take an example. Imagine our sigma is is zero one. Then sigma star we definitely know will contain empty. It will contain zero. It will contain one. It will contain zero 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 one one zero one one. Uh, and zero, 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 and zero, zero, one, and so on. There are infinitely many strings over here. Imagine a language L that contains all strings W from sigma star, such that W, or, or let's, let's make our life easier and say that it is zero N, one N, such that N is greater than we know, clearly know that L is subset of sigma star. Is this clear or not? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, what will be an L complement? L complement will contain all strings from W such that they are not in the form of zero n. So what is w? And all strings from, sorry. They are not in the form of zero star, one star for n is greater than zero. Okay, what are some of the strings which, which will be in L star? So for example, zero will be there. Okay, empty will not be there. One will be there, zero, zero, one will be there, one, zero, zero will be there, right? <clears throat> zero, one, zero will be there, one, one, zero, zero will be there, right? Zero, 
and one zero will be there and so many other strings all those strings in which the number of zeros is exactly the number of ones and all the zeros come before all the ones will not be here so you will not find any such string so this is l complement right right so if for any language l if for any language l if you could construct a turing machine that recognizes l complement then l is called co turing is this in clear this is the definition of co turing recognizer okay so we don't define that if, uh, that there is a turing recognizer for the language l no we say that a language is called turing co turing recognizable if its complement is turing recognizable Is this in clear? Uh, sir, sir uh, so according to this, the previous uh, definition that you wrote, I think that would be incorrect. No, this is because not. Why, why it would be incorrect? The previous one, not this one. The one that you started with. Which one? I think it's in the previous page. Before this page? Yeah, over here, yeah. yeah. What is the problem? You said that a language L is co Turing recognizable if it is the complement of a Turing recognizable language. Yes, that's exactly what I said. Because if A, let's say we have two sets B, A and B, and I say that A complement is B, this implies B complement is A, right? Complementation is symmetric. For example, if you complement something twice, you get it back. Right? Yes. A complement is sigma star minus A. So A complement complement must be sigma star minus sigma star minus A, which is A. Right? So a complement of complement is itself. That's exactly. Oh, Thank you. That, that's correct, right? No, yes. no, I see the, see the confusion. Yeah, but that's fine. So for A, for if, so if you have any language L, we would call that language L a co-Turing recognizable if its complement is Turing recognizable. So for this example, we know that this language L is Turing recognizable because we can construct a Turing recognizer, right? Therefore, this language L prime or L uh, complement is co-Turing recognizable. Okay, is this thing clear? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so we have a very interesting theorem here, which says, and I will leave the theory, uh, leave the proof to you because the proof is extremely simple, extremely simple. It says that a language is decidable if and only if. It, it has double F, right? It is Turing recognizable. And co Turing recognizable. Okay. There's two, two things because it has if and only if. So we say that a language is co-Turing recognizable implies, a, sorry. So we say that a language A is decidable, Turing decidable implies A is Turing recognizable, A prime, A complement is co-Turing. 
Okay, and if on the other hand, A is Turing recognizable, and A complement is co Turing recognizable, this implies A is Turing decidable. So we have two parts. Okay, uh, the proof is ex extremely simple and it's very intuitive. And I don't think that I should go into the detail. Can anyone imagine, can anyone tell me what could be the possible proof? Can you prove it? For example, if I give it an exam, will you be able to prove it? Actually, it does not require any, I mean, I mean, it, it's, it's really very simple, actually. All you need to know is, uh, is the definition of Turing recognizable, Turing recognizable, and, co and uh, Turing decidable. If you know these three definitions, you should Sir? be able to. Yes. So isn't it something like uh, if it's Turing recognizable, it accepts every string that's in the language, and if it's co Turing recognizable, it basically rejects every string that's not in the language. Yeah. So what what it happens? So we know that, for example, if we have a Turing decidable language, uh, so so for example, if we have a Turing decider, right, and the language is is in, then so so let me rewrite here. Let M be a Turing decider for L. Okay. If M be a Turing decider for L, it means that for every string X that is in L, M will accept. M will accept X. For every string that is not in L, M will reject X. Right. So what I can do, I can. So I know that if Turing, if M is a Turing decidable, I should be able to come up with, uh, if, if, if I know that L is a Turing decidable, uh, sorry, the, uh, decider for L, which is Turing decidable. So if L is a Turing decidable, we should be able to come up with such an M. And if M is a decider, it means that such a, such a L must exist. So what you can do, you can imagine this, machine M and inside this machine M, you have a Turing recognizer M1 and another Turing recognizer M2, okay? And recognizer only can recognize the positive things. They cannot do anything about the negative, right? So whenever you have some X here, so whenever you have some X here, you will pass this X to both. If it says except, then you accept. If it says accept, you will say reject. Now, M is definitely going to decide the language. Because whenever this X belongs to the language, it will accept it. And whenever this X does not belong to the language, the co Turing recognizer will recognize it as accept, and then you just reject. Therefore, this M exists. Now, this is just one part of the proof. Uh, because the part, the proof require, I mean, the theorem is if and only if, the second part is very similar and I will leave it up to you uh, to think about it, okay? Okay. As I promised, uh, I, I told you that there is a language which is not even there exists. A language which is not even Turing recognized, right? So we have a result here and we say that the complement of ATM is not Turing recognized. Can you prove it? Again, the proof is not Simple. Oh, sorry, the proof is again not. Can you prove it? Extremely 
extremely simple proof. Is anyone? So we just proved before the break that ATM is not decidable. Okay, ATM is not decidable. This is what we. We also proved that ATM is recognizable. We know that. Okay, we know that ATM is not decidable, and we also know that ATM is during the recognized. So the proof for that proof that ATM is not decidable is lengthy. Uh, it's not not intuitive, uh, but we know that it's it's not difficult. We we know we we have proven it, uh, both mathematically and as well as intuitively that how it works. And uh, showing that ATM is during recognizable is very easy. We all already have done it before. Now, now if ATM the complement of ATM is during recognizable. If ATM, the complement of ATM is Turing recognizable, this would imply that ATM is decidable. Why? From this result, which we covered here. If a language is Turing recognizable, its, it's complement is co Turing recognizable then the language is decidable. So if we say that, since we know that ATM is Turing recognizable, then if complement of ATM is also Turing recognizable, it means that ATM is decidable, which we already know is not the case. It implies the complement of ATM is not recognizable. That's the end of the proof. Simple, right? Any questions? Is the proof clear to all? Yes, sir. The proof is not difficult, right? Yeah, it's not difficult. Okay, uh, so I think we should stop here and uh, we will continue from Saturday and we will continue with uh, new things outside this chapter of decidability. Uh, so there's some buffer that we have to cover before we go to complexity. Uh, so we will look at some things before we go to competition. Now, regarding the um, uh, um, quiz results, I already have posted quiz one and quiz two on LMS, so I'm not sure how you can check it. So if you go to your LMS, then there is a way you can find out the grades, so please, check if you cannot find it out please uh, ask somebody in your class who already uh, has found a way uh, so you will be only able to see your own grades nobody else uh, not anyone else's grade uh, but please check your grades so both quiz one and quiz two have been graded uh, quiz three was online so i will compile the results and post them uh, as soon as possible uh, regarding the results for the set one in midterm i'm still working so it will take some time and um, so the next class, which is on Saturday, will be, I think, uh, probably be our last class in this uh, week before the Eid break. I'm not sure that when Eid break, uh, I mean, uh, off days will start. Uh, will it be from Tuesday yeah, or from Wednesday? I'm not sure. Will we have a class on Tuesday? So we will check. We will we will wait for the official statement. Uh, so if, if the university says no classes on Tuesday, then we won't have any class. Uh, otherwise, we will have the class. So probably uh, Saturday will be last class, and then we will have another class on Saturday. Or otherwise, we, we might have one more class before that. Anyway, in any case, um, yeah, that's all for today. If you have any questions, please let me know. I imagine um, that sir? this is not straightforward, but yeah, please, you have to uh, read the book. Yes, yes, please, go ahead. 
Um, sir, first of all, for quiz number three, we cannot uh, access the question. So is it possible for you to just make one PDF of all the questions of quiz three so that we can oh, use it for it. practice? And secondly, uh, uh, can you please also provide us with another practice set before the finals? Sure, I will. I will try my best. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, increase the deadline for problem set two. Okay, I will think about it. Uh, okay, any other question? Okay, with that, I think we should stop. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'll see you again on Saturday. Thank you. Take thank care you, for the office.